Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We were founded in 1969 by a small group of hunters, anglers, and naturalists who banded together to acquire and protect our critical forests, wetlands, and streams with the belief that some land is so beautiful and rare, it should be protected for public benefit forever. Today, more than 8,000 acres and 45 miles of trails are open for you and I to enjoy 365 days per year, thanks to their collective vision. The urgency that drove our founders continues today as we accelerate our efforts to strategically protect and restore more fragmented forests, to expand and connect our existing preserves, and to create new preserves, all the while building out infrastructure and parking lots, trails, and signage that allow access for the public while also protecting these incredible ecosystems. Nature Hour is a virtual education and lecture series with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community and regional partners. This is the final nature hour of the winter spring season, but we will be back again with more episodes beginning in September. We do have numerous upcoming engagements, including interpretive hikes, volunteer opportunities, our virtual annual meeting on Thursday, April 21st, and a special spring celebration and announcement taking place at the Ware Center in downtown Lancaster on Tuesday, May 24th. Please visit our events page at lancasterconservancy.org to sign up. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support, and tonight we want to recognize our annual sponsors, Clark Associates, Stauffers of Kissel Hill, Lexwama, Electron Energy, Dart, Ritu Associates, and Penstone. Thank you to these companies for your commitment in supporting Lancaster Conservancy's work. And now it's my pleasure to introduce three colleagues. Keith Williams, our Community Engagement Coordinator, followed by Brandon Tennis, our Senior Vice President of Stewardship, and Lucas Shoemaker, who is doing a year-long internship with the Conservancy. Welcome, Keith. Thanks, Fritz. And thanks for everybody for spending some time with us this evening as we talk about the uh, Falmouth Forest Garden. But first, we're gonna go to space. That little white dot there at the end of that arrow is us. We're just a tiny little speck of dust floating out in the vastness, uh, uh, the infiniteness of space but we're a pretty special speck of dust because as far as we can tell, we're the only speck of dust that has life on it. And while it's possible that other planets in this vast, amazing universe that we're still trying to figure out has life, it's really a remote possibility when you actually do the math. Uh, in spite, I'm gonna sound a little like Carl, Carl Sagan, in spite of the billions and billions and billions of stars and the billions of planets that, that uh, rotate around those stars, uh, the conditions for life as we know it uh, we think are really, really rare universe-wide. So we are, uh, our planet is extremely special. And that life forms these incredibly beautiful ecosystems, these interrelationships between the living matter and the, uh, the non-living matter to form you know, forest ecosystems, uh, tropical island, tropical sea and tropical reef ecosystems, tropical forests on those tropical areas, um, just full of, of lush, incredible life. Um, and, and this planet supports just this amazing biodiversity and beauty that's reflected because of that biodiversity. Our ancestors, the indigenous peoples of our, of our species knew how to live in right relation with, the, with that diversity. They knew how to re live reciprocally with all the, uh, the life and diversity on this planet. They realized that they were a part of nature. They were part of that natural ring on the right. Uh, and then modern philosophy came in, modern science came in and separated us from nature. It elevated us above nature. And so our current thinking is on the left, that we are the middle of, we are the center of, the pinnacle of all life. And, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, modern philosophers uh, propose the idea that nature is here to serve us, to serve our species rather than uh, a two-way reciprocal relationship where nature serves us and we serve nature. And the result of that is looking at nature as commodity. Um, and that, um, that's the effect of looking at nature as commodity. We leave horrible, horrible scars on the landscape as we only take and give nothing back. 
um, forests go away, minerals are taken without being uh, without anything being reforested, replaced, and that's resulted in pretty significant, not normal catastrophes globally. Uh, the tundra burns every year now. Tundra is not supposed to burn. Tropical forests burn every year. Rainforests, <laughs> right? Rain, uh, not supposed to burn. And as a result, we're losing species at a frightening pace. Uh, we are in, in the sixth mass extinction event in the history of this planet, the first one caused by our species. And, and we fail to recognize our interrelatedness um, with all that diversity and all that nature, that um, all those species dying off, it seems like we just don't fathom how interrelated we are and how we're gonna be going along the, uh, along the same way as, as the rest of that that biodiversity, that as that biosphere, that thin, thin layer of life around this planet dies, we're part of that biosphere and we're next. It seems like we can't even take care of our own species um, as evidenced by the atrocities going on in Ukraine right now. But even there, there's hope, right? I think this picture circulated on social media pretty widely about a month ago of a, a Russian soldier that was captured by Ukrainians and instead of treating him like an enemy, they gave him tea and food and let him call his mom. These are strollers at a Polish train station put, by, put there by Polish parents, knowing that Ukrainian parents fleeing Ukraine, the first thing that they would need when they got off that train would be a place to lay their baby. And there's hope on the conservation front too. We recognize that there are landscapes and ecosystems and regions that deserves special protection and special focus. And Pennsylvania's got a number of conservation landscapes. One of those is the Susquehanna Riverlands. And people are coming together around those landscapes to help restore them, to help restore the ecology of those places. In the process of restoring the ecology of those places, they're restoring that reciprocal relationship that our indigenous forefathers knew and lived and one of those places where this has all come together is the Foulmouth Forest Garden. And here to tell us the details of how the Foulmouth Forest Garden came to be is our Senior Vice President for Stewardship, Brandon Tennis. Thank you, Keith. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brandon Tennis, and I serve as the Senior Vice President of Stewardship for the Lancaster Conservancy. I hold a master's of science degree in ecological design and have worked for the Conservancy for a combined 12 years. I was raised in Kanoi Township and I am proud to be working for preserved and restored natural lands available to the public. This is my bike on the Northwest River Trail uh, at the Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserve. My bike is a symbol of me. Uh, we were both made in the United States in 1982. Uh, so in bike years, my bike and I are both considered vintage. Uh, and together we enjoy riding 12 miles from Marietta to eat blackberries at the Foulmouth Forest Garden. Kanoi Township is a keystone to important bird and mammal corridors as two ecoregions identified as the Pennsylvania Highlands, a federal designation, and the Susquehanna Riverlands Conservation Landscape, a state designation. Uh, they overlap um, in this dynamic landscape of river islands and shorelines and the foothills of the Appalachian Mountain Range. This is the site of the Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserve and the Conservancy's Foulmouth Forest Garden Project, as well as the Pole Island Nature Preserve within a chain of shallow uh, islands and riffles. The Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserve was first established in 2017 as an urgent purchase at auction. Yes, you heard that right. This land was preserved on the chopping block at public auction. The sale of the property, first identified by the Conservancy in its land protection nomenclature as the Augustine Track, uh, came to our attention from Steve Moore Sr., uh, Supervisor Chair of Kanoi Township. Mr. Moore was part champion of the Kanoi Canal Trail as predecessor of the Northwest River Trail. The Canal Trail was a formal iteration of anglers' trails for fishing the shores of the Susquehanna River beneath the York Haven Hydro Dam. The canal trail followed closely to the path of the Pennsylvania Main Line Canal from a time when big businesses battled over the federal navigable designation of the Susquehanna River. 
a lot of money and a lot of effort went into the canal to make the river navigable, uh, but ultimately it failed and honestly in pretty short order. However, success came in the form of ecotourism much later as the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Lancaster County Planning Commission, and five Lancaster County Riverside municipalities developed the canal and canal trail into the Northwest River Trail. The second acquisition was the Talon Track consisting of 20 acres of mitigated wetlands permanently protected by a conservation easement held by the Army Corps of Engineers. Due to the mitigated wetlands, the Talon Track provides small open water and swamps as additional habitat. Both tracks, however, are defined by their hydrology as high water table is connected to seeps and wetlands as connected to first order streams feeding directly into the Susquehanna River. Yet both, both preserves contain uplands as well, which for a floodplain ecosystem means only a few inches or a few feet above shoreline elevation as all the Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserves re resides within the 100 year floodplain. And as we know with climate change, uh, the 100 year floodplain is shrinking with more frequent severe storms resulting in more frequent severe flooding. And in a floodplain ecosystem, a few inches or a couple feet is the difference between a marsh like this and a forest. Both properties are now permanently preserved with DCNR deed restrictions as natural lands with public access. So although the Lancaster Conservancy is a private nonprofit, our nature preserves, although not parks, are forever available for public passive recreation. And the Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserve offers hiking, biking, bird watching, fishing, nature study, and a place of respite. Now, I know we have members of the Lancaster County Bird Club, as well as probably other uh, birding enthusiasts um, uh, attending here this evening. So please feel free to use the chat function to list the bird calls that you just heard in that video of the mitigated wetlands of the Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserve. Our primary focus, however, this evening is actually on one specific five acre area of the Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserve that is now, thanks to partners, including the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, Lancaster County Community Foundation, Lancaster County Bird Club, Rotary Club of Lancaster, Kanoi Township, and a brigade of volunteers is now known as the Foulmouth Forest Garden. Our preserve management begins with thorough assessment and analysis of a property's conservation values and existing conditions. In addition to the historic resources and the evolution of public access through improved trails, the Augustine Track also consists of 17 acres of floodplain forest, one acre of emergent wetlands, two acres of forested wetlands, a thousand linear feet of river shoreline, 1,400 linear feet of stream, a hidden slough, and all of this within the 100 year flood zone. The Augustine Tracks uplands, defined by this site as uh, a mere five foot in elevation gain, uh, was exploited as conventional corn and soy rotational agriculture. Now, hold on, I say exploited, but not to criticize any farmer, Lord knows, but uh, to be critical of land use within sensitive ecosystems. See, alluvial soils such as those found in floodplains are extremely rich in nutrients 
And conventional agriculture, especially corn crop, heavily feeds upon and ultimately depletes the nutrients from the otherwise productive soils. And so this five acres of what should have been productive floodplain forest and an area of groundwater recharge became dominated by a monoculture of advantageous and aggressive non-native plant species, namely autumn olive, which is a self-reliant nitrogen fixing plant, mind you, that thrives in nutrient depleted soils, uh, but also knotweed, multiflor rose, and mile a minute. However, mixed in, but struggling to compete were native and fruitful species such as elderberry and black walnut, both edible and medicinal. And so these target species became our template for a restoration design centered around forest gardening as an agroforestry public land management strategy. The Conservancy with support from the Lancaster County Community Foundation and the Horn Farm Center hosted a two day design workshop for the public since the concepts of forest gardens and agroforestry although practiced for a long time by settlers and to a far de greater degree and sophistication uh, by indigenous cultures, likely and especially at this very site, um, just aren't not as well known today. And so the Conservancy brought in renowned researcher, author, and forest garden designer, Dave Jackie of the publications Edible Forest Gardens Volume 1 and Volume 2 to facilitate the Tending the Susquehanna Riverlands Agroforestry as a Public Lands Management Strategy. And thus, a publicly collaborative design was drafted for Pennsylvania's first forest garden on public lands as a destination and demonstration site along the ever popular Northwest River Trail with the goals of increasing carrying capacity for both pollinating insects, animals, and humans, and resulting in overall increased biodiversity full season blooms, reintroductions, reintroduction of species of concern, and yields throughout succession. The project was implemented in two stages with the Lancaster County Bird Club funding the final canopy planting and overseeding of wildflowers and warm season grasses. And so why a forest garden? Well, to add additional conservation value to the preserved property through increased carrying capacity, through increased biodiversity, through the reintroduction of rare species, blooms extending through seasons, create a destination and demonstration site along the Northwest River Trail, honoring our cultural heritage and sustainably managing landscapes for habitat and human productivity and resiliency and honing yields through succession from old fields through meadows, woodlands, and forests. And so we thank our partners for helping us bring to fruition a public fruiting landscape. Now to take a deeper look into the diverse yields of this dynamic landscape, I'd like to introduce Lucas Shoemaker, a fellow Marietta River rat, I, I mean resident, and student of environmental engineering at the University of Waterloo. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Um, so currently, there are 14 planted canopy and understory species in the forest garden, and all these species add value to the area, both for humans and wildlife. Um, the species we have right now include aronia, black cherry, black locust, black walnut, elderberry, hawthorn, hazelnut, nannyberry, pawpaw, persimmon, red mulberry, serviceberry, shagbark hickory, and swamp white oak. There are also many other ground cover plants that are not included in this list. So several of the species in the forest garden are listed as sort of unique species or species of interest, and these include the pawpaw, aronia, and serviceberry. So the Allegheny serviceberry produces a purpley blue berry, and they're slightly larger than blueberries and taste like a mix of strawberries, blueberries with a hint of almond. Uh, many animals are attracted to the service berry, including chipmunks, squirrels, mice, voles, foxes, and black bears. Um, there are over 40 bird species that feed off of service berries, specifically thrushes, woodpeckers, and waxwings. This is a small tree and it blooms around March to April, and then the berries ripen in June. Uh, the berries are usually red before they ripen to a dark purpley blue. There are 17 service berry plants in the forest garden right now. And even though they can produce from uh, two to four years 
they can produce fruit two to four years from planting. When they reach maturity, about eight years from planting, they can produce up to 10 pounds of fruit per plant. This gives us about 170 pounds of berries per year by 2028. The berries can be used in any way that blueberries are used. Uh, some of the ways you can eat them are fresh in smoothies, pies, jams, ice cream, wine, and syrup. The pawpaw is somewhat of a unique species as it produces a tropical tasting fruit but is native to the eastern United States. It produces a large berry that looks like a mango and tastes like a cross between a mango and a banana. Um, there are many mammals that animals that eat pawpaws including raccoons, squirrels, black bears. Um, other animals that are attracted to them are birds, specifically uh, chickadees, sparrows, thrushes, woodpeckers, and jays. Deer don't like to browse pawpaw trees because they find it unpalatable. And this behavior leaves pawpaws to put more energy towards growth and reproduction. So according to the National Park Service, pawpaws will begin to become a more popular understory in forests with a lot of deer. Currently, we have 49 pawpaw plants in the forest garden. Each pawpaw tree produces about nine pounds of fruit per plant when it reaches maturity about eight to 12 years after planting. With the plants that we have in the forest garden, by 2028, they will possibly be able to produce 441 pounds of pawpaws per year. There are several ways that humans can eat pawpaws, but as they get ripe, they start to ferment and have a pretty strong stench. Some ways that we can eat pawpaws include fresh, chilled, they can be made into ice cream, there's even pawpaw beer. So with everything that the pawpaw has to offer, it's incredible that it's not a more well-known fruit. A unique species that is planted in the forest garden is aronia. The berries from this plant are dark purple and around the size of a large blueberry. It tastes a little tart and dry, so fresh berries are pretty astringent. Um, the reason that this berry is particularly unique is the high levels of antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals. The berries are eaten by deer, rabbits, and mice, as well as several types of birds, including sparrows, woodpeckers, and thrushes. There are several, there are seven aronia plants in the forest garden and they start to produce fruit within two years and mature in five years. From a mature aronia plant, you can get up to 22 pounds of berries per year. And by 2024, the forest garden will be able to produce uh, 154 pounds of aronia berries per year. Um, some of the benefits of these berries include fighting inflammation, they're antiviral, and they have the vitamin C, E, B, and K. They can be eaten fresh, although most people prefer eating them just in some way. So you can also eat them dried in baking and teas and jams. The wildlife value of these plants and this garden is incredible. There are many species that use the plants in the garden, including some species that are threatened or endangered. Among these include several types of bats, pollinators such as butterflies and bees, as well as the black pole warbler. The forest garden has specific designs to attract bats and provide habitat and roost for them, as well as a lot of the plants in the forest garden benefit birds and wildlife like the black pole warbler. There are many different species of bats that are endangered. Specific ones to Pennsylvania include the Indiana bat, the little brown bat, long-eared bat, and the tricolored bat. The small-footed bat is also a threatened species in Pennsylvania. Uh, some reasons that bats are endangered is that their hibernation is being disrupted by humans entering hibernation sites. This requires them to burn fat reserves. Um, in Pennsylvania, bats have started hibernating in human-made structures, specifically mines, which can be unstable and are subject to collapse. Two other reasons that bats are endangered is unnatural predation, um, like feral cats at entrances to hibernation sites, and white nose syndrome, which is causing many deaths within this population. Uh, white nose syndrome is a fungal disease that started in New York in two, uh, 2006, and bats with this disease wake up more often during hibernation, meaning that they spend their energy in reserves and end up dying from starvation. The Thalmouth Forest Garden provides a uh, habitat and roost for these bats. If you happen to go to the forest garden, you might see several black boxes on tall poles. These are bat boxes and they provide roost for the bats. Um, all the bat boxes are oriented in the same direction to uh, for the best accommodations for the bats. Um, so they're oriented southeast or southwest to get the most sun during the day. Another way that the forest garden is uh, attracting and helping bats is by attracting food. Uh, all of the flowering plants and fruit attract a lot of bugs, which can provide food for the bats. It's also located close to a water source, which is necessary for bats as a food source and for drinking water. 
Pollinators are some of the most prominent features of an ecosystem, but unfortunately, there are many that are endangered. Species at risk uh, of extinction, specifically in Lancaster County, include the frosted elfin, which is critically imperiled, the monarch, which is being considered for endangered species status, and the yellow banded bumblebee, which is threatened. The frosted elfin specifically uses wild blue indigo as a food and habitat. Uh, the wild blue indigo is a ground cover that is in the forest garden. These species are mostly in danger because of habitat and food loss. Many of the plants in the forest garden provide food and shelter for pollinators like, um, like these species, specifically pawpaws, black cherries, service berries, hawthorns, and black locusts are known to be habitat for butterflies. The yellow band of bumblebee can also be found in a variety of different habitats if there's abundant nesting and floral resources which the forest garden provides. The black pole warbler is listed as endangered and has been federally protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. There are reports of the black pole warbler being spotted near the forest garden and many of the plants in there continue, contribute to providing food for these birds. Many of the plants in the forest garden have something to offer, may it be food or shelter. This bird is a type of large wood warbler and usually remains in boreal conifer forests in Northern Canada, but primarily comes through Pennsylvania during migration. There are several reasons why these birds are endangered, but one of the most prominent reasons is because of habitat destruction, specifically of the boreal conifer forests. Um, in Pennsylvania, most of these forests were cut down before the 1900s and they're still in recovery. Other factors that affect these populations include tree pests and excessive deer browse. The black pole warbler also seems to run into human-made structures during their long nighttime migrations. So over the past three months or so, I've been collecting this information on these plants in the spreadsheet in order to create an overview of the wildlife and human value of the forest garden. The next few slides contain some parts of the spreadsheet that give more of an overview for each of the plants in the garden. The plants I covered today are highlighted in yellow. This part is describing the ripe product from each plant as well as how it's usually sold. Um, so the, the top part of this slide gives more of an overview of how, how much of the product the forest garden could produce per species. Um, the bottom shows how long it would take for each plant to produce this amount, as well as the estimated value that each plant could provide if the produce was sold. Um, Finally, this part of the spreadsheet shows the bird value for each plant species, allowing us to see uh, how this plant uh, benefits the ecosystem and habitat for these bird species. Um, the birds listed here are mostly just the, the main ones that eat these types of plants, but there are many others that are not listed that benefit from these species as well. Overall, the spreadsheets give us a better picture of how each plant can be of benefit for both humans and wildlife. It also allows the conservancy to predict the market value of the forest garden as well. So all of the plant species in the forest garden have some value for wildlife as well as providing human forage options. Uh, all these species are planted um, in planted in the forest garden are native to Pennsylvania and overall the garden provides a great food and shelter resource for wildlife and several endangered species. Um, now back to Keith. Thanks Lucas and thanks for uh, all your amazing work on this, uh, this project. Really well done. And so, you know, in addition to all the, the benefits that Brandon and Lucas um, talked about uh, with this particular preserve in the forest garden specifically, I think one of the benefits is that it really reestablishes some of those reciprocal relationships that, have, that we, we've forgotten about, that we've lost, right? So the ecosystem provides us services, those ecosystem services on the left, provisioning services like food, regulating services like climate and, and water cycle, cultural services for us, right? Spiritual, religious, recreational, ecotourism. Lucas and Brandon both uh, talked about a lot of those. But the other piece of that that is missing in this relationship often are the services that we provide to ecosystems. It's a reciprocal relationship, right? It's, it's two-way street. Protecting services, the Conservancy does that. And certainly the, uh, the Foulmouth Forest Garden is a good example of that. Enhancing services, right? We're adding uh, species to that space that should be there that decreased in number and we're restoring places, right? So we're elim eliminating uh, invasive species uh, from, from different preserves and different ecosystems and, and replacing those invasives 
with natives. So we're reestablishing that reciprocal relationship that is so critically important to protect these kinds of species. We stand to lose these wood thrushes and their beautiful song, 60% reduction over the last uh, half century or so. Same thing with this beautiful bird, whippoorwill. And the forest is just less than without that whippoorwill call. And we're losing fireflies, right? Xerces Society just finished a survey, first one ever done in North America, 135 species. 11% are uh, uh, considered endangered. 50%, we don't have enough information to make a determination. So we expect that 11% to go up. And certainly, in my experience through my lifetime, the abundance of fireflies has declined. Um, uh, when I look in the woods today, compared to what the woods look like at night when I was a kid, there's a lot fewer flashes. Um, and so it's a matter of, of bringing us back into right relation with, with nature, with ecology, with that reciprocal relationship, the way the Falmouth Forest Garden does. It puts us, moves us from the center of that circle to the, to, uh, among that circle, to be part of that circle, which is where we really are and where indigenous people knew that we were, that indigenous knowledge is critically important in, in terms of us finding our way forward um, from where we are now. And, and it's starting, right? I mean, we see this as the conservancy, people come out to assist us with that reciprocal work, with giving back to the ecosystem, giving back to nature through uh, tree planting and invasive species removal and ecological restoration work. As Brandon alluded to, there was a brigade of, of volunteers that helped plant um, the Falmouth Forest Garden uh, through the generous support of a number of organizations that contributed uh, finances and materials to that project. And, and it really comes down to this. The, the Hopi elders in, in June of 2000 came out with this prophecy. And it says, you've been telling people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell people that this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It's time to speak your truth, create your community, be good to each other. And don't look outside yourself for your leader. This could be a good time. There's a river flowing now very fast and it's so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They'll try to hold on to the shore. They'll feel like they're being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep your eyes open and your heads above water, see who's in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey come to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves, banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Hopi Elders Prophecy, June 8th, 2000. And I think the Falmouth Forest Garden encapsulates a lot of that. And so Lucas and Brandon, if you wanna turn your mics and your cameras back on, uh, we can start uh, taking questions from anybody that might have some. So Brandon, I've got one for you to kind of get things started. Um, that preserve that, you know, the Kanoi Wetland Preserve is kind of a, an interesting spot because it's got so many different kinds of ecosystems on it that requires pretty unique um, management, I think. Can you talk a little bit about more of the wetland side and the things that are coming up that people can look for in the, in the, uh, in the next few years on the wetland portion of, of the Kanoi Track? Sure, I think we're still learning quite a bit more about the wetlands and the species that were intentionally planted in there and then also the spread of species into the wetlands. And I would, um, I'm actually gonna take this question and refer it back to the, the forest garden. Uh, because, uh, Keith, you were alluding to a point that I think is incredibly important. Um, one of the major goals of the forest garden was to reintroduce um, species of concern and uh, species that maybe uh, should be of concern but aren't necessarily state designated or federally designated concern. And what I mean by that is uh, the reintroduction of species that we know should be in those uh, wetland and uh, floodplain forest ecosystems. 
And um, speaking with my team just the other day, you know, I kind of made the joke, but it was it was a little bit of a light bulb in my head uh, when it comes to say um, aronia, aronia melancarpa, uh, for example. Um, it's not it's not a state or federally uh, designated species of concern, but I'll be danged if I ever found one in 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 any of our nature preserves that we haven't intentionally planted. And so that was a major goal was to reintroduce these species that should be in this ecosystem um, that aren't that aren't just in uh, the forest garden area, but they're really not in the region at all anymore, at least not in any great numbers that uh, that me who tends to get out there and tromp around um, has really ever, ever found them. Um, but here's where I want to go with that, Keith, because I don't have a full inventory of uh, the plants in the wetland. But my point to be made is we introduced them purposefully into this restoration project with the intention, right? And here's where the wildlife habitat is so important. Here's where the connectivity to bird life is so important for these species to then further spread back across the ecosystem that they belong in, but they're no longer in. And so if we can set up the habitat filled with these species that should be there and attract the wildlife that then helps spread them around, um, that's when we truly get to what is ecological design. That's where we get rid of our own human centric ego and um, we are truly designing restoration for a fully functioning and healthy ecosystem. Yeah, excellent point. So, you know, talking about the aronia or the lack of aronia in a lot of the woods and you and I were, were hiking Hellam Hills this weekend with a group and, and we, we commented a couple of times about the lack of some of the, the shrubs that we would expect to see. What effect uh, does deer have or do deer have on that floristic community? And, and what's the conservancy doing to control the deer population? Yeah, so to control the deer population, um, we have included deer exclusion fencing um, for the project area. That's only in just to get the plants established. So that will come down. And I, I'm really glad that you brought this up, Keith, because I get the question quite often when I'm on the trail myself going past uh, the project area, because certain areas of the project are fenced in. Um, and it's just practical. Um, they will come down in probably about five years time once the species have really taken a hold. Once the bushing species have really bushed out, they can kind of protect themselves and hold their own with the deer population at that time. Um, however, uh, the Conservancy does rely on public hunting on 90% of its properties um, as a effective means of controlling deer population. Because even if it's not a specific restoration project area, um, our deer population is unchecked and out of control. And they're basically like rodents out there. And they are just picking apart at our landscape. And uh, so it's interesting because Paul Paul is a phenomenal species that we're highlighting in the forest garden. But what's interesting is across um, uh, a good percentage of the Conservancy's nature preserves, Paul Paul is actually thriving um, for a couple of reasons. The primary reason I would say is because um, it's slightly toxic um, to most wildlife and humans in regards to its, its, its leaves. We can't eat those and also the skin of the fruit, but not the meat of the fruit, not the pulp of the fruit. And so um, that native species that we're highlighting in the forest garden is actually thriving in other nature preserves because uh, deer uh, do not like it. And what's interesting in regards to forestry and managing our forests um, uh, for health is making sure that even our native species uh, that uh, are resistant to deer, are not palatable to deer, do not overtake an understory and prevent uh, the regeneration of our canopy trees. Um, most of those being targeted being oaks and hickories, things of that sort. And so that's an interesting kind of flip side of, of deer and also um, aggressive species that are filling and exploiting a niche. It can happen even with our native species, but it's only happening because the other species, the white-tailed deer is unchecked and out of control. 
Yeah, definitely. It's about, you know, systems being in balance. And I, I certainly have noticed how deer have a huge impact on what that, that plant committee uh, looks like. Um, Lucas, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up bats. Um, they're, they've got a special place in my heart. <laughs> and I'm really sad to see, uh, you know, the, the condition that most bat species are in, you know, for all the reasons that you stated, including white nose syndrome. And Brandon, you found a really interesting find out there. I think it was last summer that you circulated that photo of the bat that you found. But we had two questions about bats. Are there bats in the bat houses? And um, have we noticed an increase in bats uh, on Foulmouth Forest Garden? Um, and, and are they using the bat houses? And I'm wondering if, if uh, part of your response, either Lucas or Brandon, if you could talk to uh, Dan Ardia's work with the bat, the bat sensing program that he's got going on on a couple of our preserves right now with the bat, bat monitors. Lucas, I can let you uh, take a swing at that first or you can feel free to put me on the spot. Um, yeah, I mean, specifically with uh, bats in the bat houses, um, I was out there maybe a month ago and did check the bat houses and they checked the bat boxes. And um, I didn't see signs of bats yet, but I would assume closer to uh, when it gets warmer here and in the warmer months, if uh, you can probably expect to see bats in those bat boxes. Um, the best way to check for uh, to see if there are bats in is not necessarily to go up and like look up into the bat box, but instead to check the ground around it for um, like scat and to see if um, the bats are in fact using those bat bat boxes. Um, yeah, Brandon, if you want to talk about Dan's work. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, um, I want to more general talk about the the bat photo that I had shown in my portion of the presentation um, at being identified as a red bat. Um, that was hanging up underneath the foliage uh, midday of a persimmon tree. Um, and that persimmon tree at this point is only four years old, but obviously is sufficing already um, as, as shelter uh, needed for that bat in those conditions. So that is a very promising sign that, um, you know, human beings have figured out how to um, replant trees, but we haven't quite figured out how to recreate fully functional ecosystems. We have some ideas, but we haven't figured that out yet. So it's a really good sign when we see the habitat working and the additional species showing up um, and utilizing the habitat that we have created. Um, the other thing I'd like to say about bats is, and I wanna kind of call back to my first or second slide that I let off with, uh, the importance of the overlapping ecoregions in which this uh, the Kanoi Wetlands Nature Preserve and the Foulmouth Forest Garden uh, resides within. So it is the Susquehanna River Corridor, which is a migratory route um, north to south, um, but it's also being crossed by the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains known as the Pennsylvania Highlands. And this combination of these two overlapping ecosystems are absolutely perfect for shagbark hickory. And shagbark hickory is a really great um, um, uh, provider of bat habitat. Little brown bats will actually use the shagbark uh, fissures of the bark as it pulls away from the tree uh, to get up under a lot like the uh, red bat uh, was using the foliage of the young persimmon um, during the midday uh, environment. So we were very intentional even with our species uh, selection uh, to make sure that we're providing habitat and specifically for birds and bats. Yeah, awesome. And so let's talk a little bit more about, about some of the management of, of encouraging uh, those, those species that we, we've selected to put there uh, on their way. And so we got a question, does the Conservancy do any sort of weeding or the plants permitted to grow just willy nilly? And let me take the first swing at that generally because I'm up to my elbows in invasives <laughs> and then I'll pass it to you to get more specific. In fact, we just, uh, we just removed 350 gallons of uh, Japanese honeysuckle from uh, the Kelly's Run Pollinator Park this afternoon with a volunteer corporate group. Um, our volunteer land stores to date have removed 600 gallons of garlic mustard from Shanks Ferry. So we, uh, under the direction of our forester, uh, uh, Eric Roper, uh, who, who is a master at developing uh, vegetation management plans for all of our preserves, we are actively managing a lot of the invasive plant species out there, but you know, there's just so much of it. Uh, it really is largely a triage and um, a very targeted uh, attack on where we're gonna work. Um, maybe Brandon, you can speak to the work that's specific to Foulmouth Forest Garden. We do have a work day coming up on the 29th there too. 
um, but maybe speak about you know some of the planting that's ongoing there and some of the the weeding, the uh, the invasive plant removal from there. Sure, and I can rightfully hear some of the criticism maybe from our silent audience, uh, knowing our preserves really well. Um, it's extremely difficult to keep up with uh, the removal of invasive plant species. And I may even argue and stick my neck out there, but you're all silent, so you can't you can't come at me right now anyway. Um, we're not gonna get rid of them. We're not gonna get rid of them. Um, so we have to do damage control. And so typically the conservancy applies uh, kind of a, a, a zones type of uh, methodology towards how we um, uh, prioritize uh, invasive species removals across our nature preserves. And so um, zone four and five would be our more wild areas, uh, you know, our much larger preserves than uh, what the Kanoi Wetlands is, uh, more so like Welsh Mountain Nature Preserve, which is uh, a full 960 acres. Um, that would represent a zone four and five, which is, um, you know, as wild of uh, a, a landscape and an ecosystem that we really have in Lancaster or York counties. Um, within those areas, um, we're hot spotting because invasive species shouldn't be able to take a hold, uh, especially in a a mature um, 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 mature uh, uh, forest. They shouldn't be able to take a hold, but they do come in. And so when we see them come in, even though it's zone four and five, we're going after them and making sure that they don't take a hold and start spreading. Um, the Falmouth Forest Garden would represent more of a zone one or two. And that's because it is a demonstration site. It is a destination on the Northwest River Trail. And so uh, at times we'll kind of use this zoning um, as a way to prioritize um, and really focus on where we're kind of laying the lines with invasive species removal um, and, and kind of, you know, in some respects, go into battle with them, just kind of keeping after them. Um, that's all that was in the Forest Garden Project site, really, um, except for a few native things as far as black walnut um, and some elderberry coming up. Uh, we were pulling out some pretty large autumn olive. Uh, there's, there's two specific kind of design kind of types and management types for the forest garden that I didn't go into in the presentation. And I'll just brief with that right now. There are areas that I mentioned that are within deer excluded areas, and those actually have uh, ground cover. And so we planted uh, a ground cloth. And so we planted into the ground cloth. Uh, we chipped the ground cloth. Now that we're in year three, four, and five of that project, um, all of those um, really aggressive non-native species that we have smothered with that ground cloth, we're gonna start pulling that ground cloth back. And with funding that has been provided from the Lancaster County uh, Bird Club, we're actually gonna begin overseeding now uh, with um, pollinator plant species, dynamic accumulators, um, ground covers, things of that sort. There's another area of the forest garden um, that's an old field type of ecosystem. And the plantings that we intentionally put in the old field areas uh, were based more upon the canopy species at uh, their maturity dimensions. And so the spacing of those plants are much further apart. So when you go up there, please just note, walk right through the forest garden because there's a little trail system in it. Walk right through the forest garden and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about because it's obvious and it'll be interesting, I think, for all of us to see how that management strategy uh, evolves over the next seven to 10 years. Yeah, great. And we also had a question about how we're defining native, uh, specifically a question about Baptista. Is that really native to Lancaster? And so that's a really great, I think, point to make that just because something is native to say, you know, North America or the mid-Atlantic doesn't necessarily mean it's native to here. Can you comment on that either Lucas or Brandon? Lucas, I'm always gonna let you take first swing, but feel free to put me in the hot seat. Go for it, Brandon. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, it's tough. We strive towards favoring um, native species, so pre-colonial species, as best as we know. And I do my best, but we have high standards, but there are species that are naturalized at this point, 
they've found their place and they're balanced and we would create more damage if we went to remove them than good at this point. And so again, it kind of goes back to those zones and the intention of our management. Um, for the Baptisia, um, it's, so I would argue that that is naturalized at this point. And one of the reasons that it's um, in the forest garden is because it's a long lived perennial nitrogen fixer. And that is exactly what forest gardens do need. Orchards need that. And they're almost entirely depleted of that. They're monocultures. A forest garden is not a monoculture. And so plants play a lot of different roles and they have a lot of different relationships with one another. They benefit one another. This is, this is getting into um, the discussion that um, I'm not gonna go too deep into, but um, again, we know how to plant trees, but we don't necessarily know 100% how to recreate a functioning ecosystem. All we can do is pick the right plants and put them in the right place. And again, so for Baptisia being a long-lived perennial nitrogen fixer, it's one of the very few that we have that is either native or at this point naturalized. The other one that we can rely on in the forest garden is black locust, but we have to watch that, right? Because black locust really has a tendency to run and shoot up from its roots. And so we may end up with just a monoculture of black locust trees. So it takes a lot more kind of uh, long-term management on our part. And Baptisia doesn't behave like that. Yeah, excellent point. And so, you know, this takes a lot of active management. And I think the perception is often that, you know, pre-European settlement, humans really didn't do active management, but that's not the case. And Brandon, you alluded to that, that this is part of a cultural heritage. Uh, that this site has been actively managed by by humans for for eons and and we're kind of re remembering that that relationship with the land right we shape the land and the land shapes us concept instead of the separate from from idea and um, you know everything you just laid out there about the reasoning behind using selecting for certain plants and deselecting for others i think that's what um you know our our, our native native ancestors have done um you know pre-european settlement um, certainly in their management techniques uh, that favored certain plants and it deselected for other plants. Um, and Keith, your your ego and your eco chart that you shared is perfect, right? Because in the eco chart, um, it reminds us that that human beings are nature. We're not much different than the animals. We're not yeah, much right. different than the plants. Um, we have to find our balance the way that they have to find their balance as well. Um, and unfortunately in Lancaster and York counties here, we live in a fragmented landscape. If you haven't realized it, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. We live in a fragmented landscape. And so we humans have done that. And so there's a responsibility to manage accordingly to revert that damage. But our landscape will remain fragmented. Despite the great work of the conservancy in, in building out a portfolio of natural lands and public lands, 8,000 acres now and growing. We still live in a fragmented landscape. And so our stewardship team is forever gonna be busy and we're forever gonna have limited resources, not enough resources for the amount of work that we have. And so again, going back to how do we target, how do we prioritize invasive species plant removal? Um, we have to do that. We have to figure out our criteria figure out um, our prioritization, figure out our game plan and go at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lucas and Brandon, thank you so much for putting this together and for your time. Do either one of you have anything else that you would, uh, you'd like to share before we, uh, we close out the night? I would just say that you should go visit the Forest Garden. Um, it's a really great resource uh, and has wonderful value to wildlife in the area as well as um, human forage options. There's a lot of different plants that you can eat that are in the forest garden. Um, and I recommend go try some, um, yeah. Absolutely, right? That's one of the reasons why our preserves are there or for our community to go and enjoy. So get out there and, 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 and uh, follow Lucas's suggestion. And my last piece, Keith, is one of the reasons we were so interested in doing this project was not just uh, introducing agroforestry as a public land management strategy, which we are doing because our natural lands have 
always been working lands as long as people have lived on this landscape, indigenous colonists, settlers, whoever it may be, we are a part of it. Um, however, our nature preserves are typically very sensitive ecosystems. And so this is the age of the internet and this is the age of social media platforms. And what we were finding is people were actually uh, geotagging or geo-referencing um, say pawpaw groves in very sensitive ecosystems on the Conservancy's other preserves. So with this now being right along the Northwest River Trail and the intention of it being multifunctional for both humans and, and, and animals, if you want your taste of pawpaw, you know exactly where to go to get them now. That's a great point. Yeah, this is a place where you can you can take things from this place. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, don't do that other places, <laughs> right? Leave no trace. All right, thank you, thank you all, and thanks for uh, being here this evening, everybody. Thanks for spending uh, your evenings with us this this uh, uh, Nature Hour season. We look forward to seeing you all again, well, in person, obviously, because now our in-person season is really kicking into high gear. So, check out our website for upcoming events and volunteer opportunities, and we'll see you virtually uh, in the fall. Good night, everybody.